boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Michael Tariga. First of all, Michael, just want to say thanks for coming on the show. It's, um, you've got a very interesting story, a brutal story, if I'm honest. You were left at birth by your mum. Yep. You were raped from the age of four. Um, you've had a pretty heartbreaking story, brother. And it's, uh, first of all, thanks for coming on. You've got your new book out, Meat Rack Boy. Yep. Very, yep. very, very powerful. So, um, how have you been, first of all? What, health-wise? Yeah, I know it's oh. not great because you've only got a few oh, months to down, live. It's down the pan. I'm on, yeah. the way I'm on morphine all the time. Um, God forbid weed. But <laughs> I believe, you know, yeah, the story's out. I can relax and if I'm brutal, I can snuff it knowing that it wasn't. For nothing. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. everything, there must have been a plan somewhere, not God, because I don't believe in bloody God, you know. A guy called Fred Lemon, a, a crook, he's, he turned to God in the jail and he said, God appeared to him wearing a bowler out in a pinstripe suit. Well, God didn't appear to me in any of that. Mm -hmm. You know, God never appeared. So yeah. I don't believe believe in God and I don't talk about bloody God but other than that yeah it's been it's been an interesting few years yeah. the last few years health wise yeah well fair play for coming out and telling your story you've terminal illness terminal illness just now where you've only got a few months to live so you want to tell it as to many people as you can so this is one of the reasons we're here when we read your story it was heartbreaking we were nearly in tears so we'll go right back to the start Michael and um where you grew up and kind of... Right. Um, my father was a Spanish refugee. He, he fought against Franco. Um, he's a Basque. He was a Basque. He's dead now, long dead. And he came to this country. Never met him. Mother was a prostitute from the west coast of Scotland, bless her soul. Come down to London to hawk her mutton, ply her trade, call it whatever you like. And... Um, Met the old man, and I think as a result of a Saturday night on a piss, my sister was born. Promptly put into care into Shirley Oaks in London from birth, a home that was run by Lambeth. Or in those days, it was the LCC, the London County Council. Two years, no, just less than two years, because my sister was born in the August. We were born a year the following October, so... They must have met up again and had another night on the piss because my twin brother and I were born. Um, <laughs> I always say that um, my mother must have taken one look at my brother and said, fuck <laughs> this, I am off. <laughs> you know, from what I've seen, the one photo I've got of him, he wasn't the best of looking chap. <laughs> <laughs> but... I never met him, although after a certain age, when they disappeared, I never met them. My brother and I were put in to two nurseries. This is what the records, the official records show. And my sister was in Shirley Oaks. Now, we were taken straight from Lambeth Hospital, where I was born, to the nursery. Mother had gone. Father had gone to God knows where. At about three and a half, I have got the dates in the records. I can't remember off my head because I'm on shitloads of drugs to keep me going. And we were taken to what was called a family home. The authorities were trying to get out of this big home Thing. and you know the institutional homes and they were coming in to these family homes and I had the misfortune of being taken along with my siblings to 2 Gravely Avenue in Boreham Wood run by oh, Bob and Ivy Woods Robert Woods Bob and Ivy Woods married couple he pursued his own work interests at um, Handy Page. 
and she was a full-time house mother, housewife, house mother. But there were seven kids there, including us three, all on long-term fostering. So it wasn't as if kids were coming and going and all went to the local schools. The first night there is the night it started. I wasn't close to my brother, even though we were twins. I'd barely seen him. I didn't know him because we were in different nurseries. And my sister, I didn't know at all. And they were put to bed. I was put in a sink to be bathed in the kitchen sink. It was a bloody big Belfast sink. It was a big house. And um, the abuse, the sexual abuse started then. How old were you? Four, oh. maybe. Not certainly not a lot older. And oh, it, it, it was nightly, but they. My brother and sister were left alone. <clears throat> but because I was, in the words of the records, a sulky child, I was alone. But I was being, I didn't know it was abuse. I was being hurt, right, by sexual penetration. Right? And it bloody well hurt and it bloody well made me grumpy. I became, oh, the worst nightmare ever. I was stealing at five years old. I was fighting, fighting back in the only way that came to me. You know, I would wet the bed. And if being buggers as a child, I'd shit the bed, for which I'd get into trouble. Yet I couldn't do nothing to stop it. And this went on, oh, for 11 months plus. But I came home from school and my brother and sister were no longer there. They'd gone to another home. I learned afterwards that the woods wanted to adopt me, but it, it didn't go ahead because um, I don't think I was deemed as um, adoptable. Did you ever try and tell anyone at that age, four or five? I ran away at, I think it was six years old. No, maybe younger. To Borenwood Police Station, middle of winter in my underwear and no shoes on because I was being be I'd been told to get the wooden spoon and they were going to give me a, a beating for lying. I ran to the police station. It was a day after I'd been sold to two or three people for an hour, 20 minutes, whatever in London and my backside was bleeding. I was sore and I rang to the police station. I, I just had a gut feeling at that age. I didn't want to be hurt anymore. And I ran to Borenwood Police Station, which is for a youngster was quite a long run. And a milkman picked me up on, I think, and I might be wrong, Radlett Lane in Borehamwood or Shanley Lane, I can't remember, and took me to the police station, wrapped me in his, he had a donkey jacket, and he wrapped me in that, because bear in mind, I'm in a vest, a little pair of pants and nothing else. And I told the police officer on the desk that I was hurting. I'd run away because I was hurting. And like a bloody idiot, 
I gave them the name and address of where I lived. And of course, they rang Bob and Wood Ivy, Bob and Ivy Woods, who came down to Borenwood Police Station, who were promptly told to take me home. I was in need of discipline. Now, this came from a police officer. And taken home I was, and disciplined I was. But we had we, we have it on record actually that um, a welfare officer, I think her name's Watch, came down to visit me at Borenwood unexpectedly because we were under an order where we couldn't or I couldn't be moved from the house for any reason without the written consent of the authority. Now that is documented. And she came down unexpectedly and I wasn't there. And Bob and Ivy Woods weren't there either. And when they asked the deputy house mother where I was, and again, it's documented. She was told that I had been taken away for three days because I'd been naughty. When in actual fact, I was taken away for a week to be naughty. I was taken to Eastbourne where I was bought and sold daily and nightly to many many men. Now, sometimes I'd get half a crown or two bob, but they were being paid. I'm absolutely certain that once you have been sexually abused as a child, you are tainted. And you might as well have it tattooed on your head take me because every fucking paedophile in London would know exactly who you are mm -hmm. there were rings going around all the time and it involved people in high places as well as low places I used to see they used to put us on the meat rack boy Hence the name of the book, Meat on, on Put Us on the Meat Rack in Piccadilly. Hence the name Meat Rack Boy. I wasn't the only one. But let's get this right. There were hundreds of them. Kids were two a penny in London in the 50s. You know, you could buy and sell a child, get rid of it, and no one would know. And this went on. You know. But um yeah, my brother and sister of, yeah, what the part that I was just telling you where they came down, although that's documented, there is no record of it ever being investigated. Uh, Jenkins a big cover up then. Right. And I have to ask why. But also, I can show you two sets of files. What Lambeth gave me, called Family Files. Now, Brandy, do you mind? She's one of them, you? Now, everything virtually pertaining to myself is redacted. Mm -hmm. Why? So you were getting abused, you were getting raped from your foster parents and they were selling you to get raped also because you were rebellious against that and you had so much hate and rage when you went to the police station the police says it was just because you were rebellious, you were making it up, and they were sending you back to the house. Yes. How long did that go on for, from your foster parents? 11 months? Yeah. And uh, where where did you go after that? I was moved to All Saints Convent in London Coney, run by nuns, Sisters of the Poor. And I will state, here and now, it was the only time in my childhood that I found love 
from people who were not wanting anything in return. They, the nuns were fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And the only thing that was wrong, I couldn't, my brother and sister were there, but they were in a different house to me. They were in St. Gabriel's, I was in St. Raphael's. And the only time we met was church high days, midnight mass, etc. because we, the two houses lived different lives apart from Sundays at chapel. But then I didn't really know him, so what was there to talk about? You know, it was, but I went off the rails badly. I just, I couldn't hack people. It's all, was always there and always has been up until I got this book out. What do they want? Why are they being nice? And, oh, I was stealing anything I could get my hands on. I would deliberately go out my way to hurt people, both physically and mentally. I, I was just, I was a nightmare and I went to the police three or four times in between jails, jail spells. I went to the newspapers where a newspaper of a red top told me that what I'd written was a load of old bollocks. I gave the first book I, I wrote, well, I suppose it was the forerunner of the uncouth loud. I was up before a judge at the Bailey and um, I thought, how am I going to write my life and give it to him? Didn't trust solicitors. Solicitors, as I said, if you pay for justice, you'll get justice. If you can't afford it, you won't. Simple as that. You know, it's the luck of the gods. So I wrote this block, 480 fucking pages of full scav, my whole rotten life story. And he read it before I was weighed off and came back and he said, Mr. Tarek, he said, I've read this missive. <laughs> I have every sympathy with what you have been through. I go to prison for three years, take him down. Fucking take him down, I had to sit down for fuck's sake. <laughs> and um, I learned nobody was going to listen to you. And wrongly, I thought in my head, the only way is to be outrageous, do things. You know, I went on hunger strikes in the jail, but I couldn't tell them why. You know? Because I wouldn't believe you? No. Well, not just that. The shame of it. Did you start because... bot yeah, did you start bottling it all up because you were ashamed and embarrassed that you thought you'd done something wrong? Not because I'd done something wrong. No, not you, but in your head. But because I hadn't stopped it. Mm -hmm. It leaves Child abuse, sexual abuse, leaves a horrible, horrible stench behind. It stinks, you know? And it's not the perpetrator of it who's tainted. It's the victim yeah. who's tainted. And more so when you're being passed around. You know, ev every person, Every male who ever came near me, whether I'd be in a jail, whether they'd be screws, probation officers, solicitors, always, always in the back of the head. Do they believe me, for starters? And what do they want? 
what yeah. are they? Do they think I'm a puff? Yeah, they'd want to rape you. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. And it does. It, and it mentally, of course, man. That that sort of trauma, and, that sort of trauma, Michael. You carry it. I've wrecked four marriages, right? Because of this. A because I didn't tell them. B because I didn't know how to handle it. Trust issues. Yeah, big trust issues. And strangely enough, the only time where I could start to handle it is when I went cold turkey. I became a drug addict. What were you addicted to? Everything. Acid was the drug of my choice. <laughs> Excuse me. That's okay. Where were we? Yeah. Um, the trust it, issues with marriages. Big style. And addictions. I, I used to wonder if I was queer. Seriously, I know it's a horrible word to use, but I don't like the word gay because I can see nothing gay about puffery. Right? Not, I've got nothing again. I did. I hated homosexuals. Hated them with a passion. If they came near me, they were going to receive violence. Big style. Not because I hated them for being homosexual. Because of the rapes you went through. But I hated what men had done to me. Yeah. You know, and what women Mm -hmm. as well. Had done to me. So was women sexually child, assaulting yeah. you as well? Yeah. I was filmed as a small child having to do things with my sister, who was a year older than me. Neither of us knew not a clue what we were doing. I didn't know what a bloody freckle was. To me, a woman's genitals looked like a bloody rotten hedgehog. You know what I mean? I didn't have a clue. But there's an eight millimetre film of my sister and I doing things. Yeah, and I know you. you know? I know you says there that you were angry at yourself that you couldn't stop it. But when you're going through that trauma and those rapes and all that pressure, it starts to become a part of you where you become robotic. I found that I went about the whole issue in the beginning. In my mind, wrong. I've done it the wrong way. Right? I should have killed them. It's easier said than done. When I had the opportunities, I should have killed them. Did that go through your mind? When I was a grown-up, it went through my mind. For years, it went through my mind to find these people. How long did they... Did you ever out them while they were alive? Or when they were still alive, did you think? Um, like I you used says, to go searching. Yeah, for them? Yeah, I, used to, I went to sea. I was a seaman. Became a seaman. Fisherman. And I used to go searching. I'd, I'd knock on people's doors to find these people. And with the plan was to kill. To kill them. So when you got older... If you'd seen your abusers I, then, you would have killed them if you'd seen them? Yes. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. But, uh, the, the anger, it wasn't just anger, it was rage. Absolute rage. And this went on for years. And anybody who came near me, including those I married, were rejected. I'm ashamed to say that. I put no effort into the marriages at all. It was kind of trying to get a mask of reality because up until, I don't know, 40, 50, my life was a kaleidoscope. You know, I'd been taking drugs since the 60s. To block out the pain. Every drug, to block out bloody life. Mm -hmm. 
I used to go to sea for long stretches at a time and months, come back and go on the piss and stay totally drunk for a week after six, seven, eight months at sea. Did you ever think about taking your own life? Oh, I tempted it many, many times. The times I've walked to the arse end of a boat that I've been on and thought, shall I, in the middle of the night, no one's going to fucking know, you know, and for hours, I'm gone. And being a bit of a coward, it worried me that the water would be cold. I wouldn't say you were a coward, mate, I would say you're anything but. It was to block life out. You know, the life I was living wasn't a good life. Although I had money in my pocket and I didn't have any friends because I wasn't going to allow anyone to get close to me. Is that in case they abused you? Not abused me physically, but mentally. I was paranoid, very paranoid. But that, that was the drugs. So I'll move in a minute. We'll have to stop filming. I'll clean That's up. okay. And um, at least he uses the pads, but he's only a pup. <laughs> and it, it was frightening. But what I was becoming, I neglected my own son completely, just fucked off. I went to the Foreign Legion. You know, I had a bit of fun there twice. You know, and I, I used to get bored, very, very bored, very quickly. And it got to the state where I had nothing. I was rock bottom. I was full of chemicals, full of anger, hatred, absolutely despised myself. And I was a full-blown drug addict. Homeless. And at that stage, I just, I'd had a bad accident at sea where I'd lost my spleen, smashed all my ribs up, smashed this lung up, and had the onset of what they thought was cancer. So I, I was a mess. But I came up to Blackpool. Overnight on a coach. This is March, February, February 2008. January, yeah, January, end of January, beginning of February. And I went to the homeless project run by the Sally Army in Blackpool. I'd never ever been so low. I thought I could cope with anything. I was the roughy toughy, the foreign legion, cope with anything. But I couldn't cope with the loneliness anymore and the anger and trying to scrabble about and keep getting the drugs that were blocked was becoming a bit of a chore. And they put me in touch with a, a woman called Debbie Ashley. Uh, Debbie Ellis. Debbie Ellis, who was the manager for um, this hosp hostel charity, the Ashley Foundation, who gave me a room. And I had shelter. And I decided after a while, I fucked about with them. Give them a dog's life. They'd been kind, so they were going to get paid in kind. You know what I mean? And I decided I didn't want to do drugs anymore. Just one day, I said, fuck this. And I went cold turkey for two weeks, locked myself in a room. And just with... Bundles of black coffee and bundles of tobacco, lots of tobacco. No weed, no fuck all. And I locked myself 
into a room, put a CD of Leonard Cohen on, on loop, and just went cold turkey. And I would not recommend it to anyone. <laughs> God almighty. What drugs were you coming off then? Heroin, cocaine, acid, methadone. They Night just lit up the board yeah, when they drug tested. The nightmares must have been fucking and horrific. Oh, for two weeks, I only came out to get coffee. Didn't eat. Couldn't eat. What weight were you then, Michael? Must have been thinner. <sighs> Dead and stone. Yeah. And when I came through it, I couldn't handle it. My temper was very, very quick. I threatened to cut a member of staff's throat over three pilchards. And I, I won't go into it, what happened, but I got nutted off, right? The shrink factory, where the first person I spoke to was Georgie, mm -hmm. my George. Your new partner over 12 years? Yeah, who was, is, mm -hmm. completely mad. <laughs> is that how it works? It's on my level of madness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're on a level of madness mm -hmm. that suits the pair of us. And I can't speak for Georgie, but with her, I'm as happy as Larry. Mm -hmm. No drugs, apart from weed. But I see weed as medicinal. And morphine is medical. That's given to me medically. And um, I wrote the book. I thought, I've got to get my story out. So I wrote The Uncouth Lao, The Successful Failure, wonderful, wonderful title, The Life of an Uncouth Lao. And I wrote that as a statement and paid for it, got it out, only 500 copies, but which, if Rosie Waterhouse sees this, it wasn't published. It was printed by me and handed out. She says it was published. But Rosie Woodhouse is an ass. Mm -hmm. You don't have no time for her. And um, the rest is kind of history. I hate people. Thousands upon thousands of emails, messages going, oh, you're brave to do this. You're an inspiration. You're speaking for us. No, I fucking hands. Mm. Yeah. Not at all. I'm not brave. I'm a gutless fucker who should have fought this years ago, the proper, proper way. I'm not an inspiration to anyone. I wouldn't want anyone to aspire to be me. You know what I mean? I'm an ass, an idiot. Yeah, I think you're too hard on yourself, Michael, uh, because the abuse you went through, mate, and uh, people oh. would, yeah, but people would close off and not want to speak about it. By you speaking about it, brings other people forward. Because I know you went up against, is it Lambeth, with the council? Lambeth council. And you received a check, um, compensation, and but now they're saying they never gave you money, is that, that correct? Was, they gave me Shirley Oaks Children's Home, of which I was in, Lambeth admitted that abuse went on in that home. It was one of their homes. But before they became Lambeth as a borough, it was LCC, London County Council, as everything was. And then in 65, the boroughs are all split up to become what they are now, Wandsworth, Lambeth, Battersea. Now, none of them, not one of them will accept, accept responsibility for my care. Yet Lambeth supplied me the records. They say they're family files and I'm only in them because my twin brother and sister is in them, right? Because they cared for my twin brother and sister. Now I, Looks hard. We were taken into care legally 
1952, all three of us, the siblings, together, under the same care order, under the 1948 Children's Act. Now, there is no provision anywhere under that act. In fact, it was expressly forbidden for siblings, unless in exceptional circumstances, to be split up. And you could not transfer care from one authority to another. You could put children from Lambeth into a home run by Wandsworth, but you couldn't hand the care over to Wandsworth. The care was the responsibility of Lambeth, right? Because they hold the care order. Now, they say this is not true, but nobody is saying who holds the care order or held it. Nobody is telling me where you can get it from either, right? Lambeth have continuously, I can show email after email from these asses to go to the LMA, the London Metropolitan Archives, that hold the records of all children in care in England and Wales. Yet it doesn't. Because when you get your records, it's a series of numbers. It's a card index. And they give you a rough translation. But the one they gave me, the dates don't add up. Yet it's supposed to be a true, true record. The dates don't add up. They have me at eight years old in the Holly's children's home or... No, I can't remember the exact age of my head is on the record. Travelling from Sidcup in Kent by public transport to London Coney near St Albans. A round trip of 90 miles on my own. Now, this is a child that the authorities state at eight years old, a shrink has said this, is sexually active and is maladjusted. Now, I would love to have an answer to this. Who in their right senses sends a child who in their own words is sexually active and maladjusted on a trip from Kent into London on his jacks, from London to St Albans, St Albans to London Coney to go to school. What sort of fucking time must he have left in the morning to go to school? Because bear in mind... You didn't have the transport system that you have now. And it shows that this is all nonsense or doctored. So they're trying to cover everything up that people were abused in their care? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. What age did your abuse stop, Michael? 14. 14? Yeah. And ha your, when I came out of care. Your book, Meet Rat Boy, everybody's speaking about it to now. It's, um, it's a heartbreaking read. So... How did Not all heartbreaking. There are some viewers. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's um, but for the uh, for people looking at it and reading the abuse kind of claims, it's um, obviously with if the the Ted Heath thing as well, the former prime minister. How did that story come about? Right, listen. Ted Heath was of no consequence to me. Absolutely none whatsoever. He was one of thousands, right? There was no sexual penetration. It happened, I was... See, now this, again, shows where the authorities lie and tell lies. I'm under the care of the courts. The authorities have me under their care, under a court order. 
So in legal speak, they are acting as my parents, yeah? We agree with that, yeah? Mm -hmm. They state that at the school that I'm talking about where this incident happened, that I was on home leave. Again, the question has to be asked, where was home? Because there ain't no record of it. And bearing in mind that they were my legal guardians, I stayed at the school during the home leave. Right? I'd go to Shirley Oaks or the Hollies, play up. They couldn't handle me. I'd go back to the school and finish holidays there. A guy called Max Sharman, who was the um, deputy headmaster, said, did I want to go sailing? Yes. I was the only boy there. Nothing else to do. He was either that or do fucking chores, gardening, which I didn't want to do. So we went to a place called Pin Mill, which was then a little yachty haven, nothing. There were no gin palace. Or, they were sailing boats probably up to 30, 35 foot at uh, the most. And we went sailing. There was four of us. Me, Ted Heath, I didn't know who he was. The doctor from the school and the fucking deputy headmaster. And I was told to go nude swimming, which I did. Ted Heath dried me. Give me a blowjob, played me with Willie, had me do kissing. Well, he was kissing more than blowing, to be quite honest with you. And got me to do the same to him. And that was the extent of it. I got half a crown and a fag. That was the extent of it. Stole and it butters. didn't open, didn't happen in the open. We went in the cabin on this thing. Just a single cabin. It's still bad, though. It, of course it's bad, but... There was nothing I could do. Yeah. Just, I couldn't have said no. Although you'd think at 13, 14 years old, you know. Yeah. But if you haven't got anybody, mm -hmm. right, to back your corner, who the hell do you tell? Yeah. See, at that time, Michael, see, because you've been through all that much with the rapes and the abuse, was that becoming the kind of the norm that it was actually becoming normal that adults it was were, the norm. adults were treating you like that? For me, we were pieces of meat, hence the name the meat rack. And how did it how did it come about that you wanted to write the meat rack? I met I wrote um the uncouth out and I paid for it. I paid for it to be printed and I gave it away for donations. And just to see what people's reactions were. Were you nervous about writing it? Not about writing it, but giving it away, giving it to people to read. I was terrified, absolutely terrified. And after I'd done it and given it away, and it went very, very quickly, and we raised 600 quid for a charity with it. It cost six grand to do it, but it was never, ever about money. So, Ollie, I think it's good to touch on the fact that all proceeds from the Meat Rat Boys goes to help victims who have gone through the same abuse. Every penny. Yes, which is amazing. Thanks. I do not see one bean of it. And... I pay my own expenses. You know, I, I just went and done the justice speech to the GMB Northwest um, Justice Conference, and I paid myself. I asked for nothing. I don't want nothing. Mm -hmm. See, bottling up over the years, Michael, and now obviously with the book coming out and everybody wanting interviews, how do you feel now speaking about it more? Does it bring back a lot of memories and hurt and pain, or you kind of... Just accepting it not to try and move suicidal, on. Not if that's what you're thinking. Yeah. So you're in a bit, obviously you're in a good place now. You've got your missus. Oh, God. Have a look. Have a look. This isn't a palace. Mm -hmm. The flat I rent. We've been here 11 years. We've got it how we want it. Everything in it belongs to us. 
Nothing's brand new, but I don't want brand new. You know, Georgie and I, 12 years, we have never, ever had an argument over anything. We're both laid back. You know, arguing, fighting takes energy. I haven't got any energy now left. You know, if I had energy, I'd still be DJing and I was bloody useless. <laughs> I was useless. I was the worst DJ ever. But I had the most fun. I had the best of equipment, believe me, thousands. Thousands of pounds spent on it. Never charged because if I charged, people could complain. If they ain't paying, they got no right of complaint. Simple as that. Because you're doing it for free. And I played what I wanted. Mm -hmm. But I'm a 60s, 70s music man. You yeah. know what I mean? I'm none of this fucking crap rapping. <laughs> you know, I'm an old school person. That's mm. why I speak the way I do. Because I am not going to pander to anybody's wishes with the way I live my life, the way I speak. You know, I had enough in my childhood and my teenage years of being bullied and messed about. It, it's never going to happen again. And now I've found my place. God, I'm the happiest I've ever been. Good. It don't worry me one little bit that people call me a liar, although nobody has, apart from Rosie Waterhouse, bless her little heart, who I would really, really like to meet. Yeah, this is a girl on Twitter which we spoke yeah, about earlier who, who called really you a liar. I'd like to meet her and sit down with her and just ask her where she gets her information from hmm. and why she hasn't come and spoken to me. I'd like someone from Lambeth Council to explain to me why they refuse to talk to me properly, right? Why they gave me a load of bullshit. They told me to appeal. But what they didn't tell me was the judge is in their bloody wrong pockets, being paid by them. So you're never going to win it. So I'll go back to the book again, Michael. It's uh, when you started writing it, how were you feeling then? bring back a lot of emotion for you or did you know what you were doing was going uh, to help others no at, at times I cried I still cry I'm, I'm up at two o'clock in the morning every day I can't sleep I sit in there in the lounge and um, of course my mind wanders and I wonder whether I've done the right thing whether by doing this my heart says yes. You've got to get it out. You've got to talk to people. If they want to interview you, then, you know, depending what kind of ass they are, whether you <laughs> do it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're serious and going to take me serious, then yes. But if they're going to rip the piss, then it ain't going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. And it's never ever been about money. I've never asked for money. When Shirley Oaks brought the compensation scheme out, I thought, right, I was there. So I'm entitled to. And yet they tried to deny that. You know, and the book, I really wanted it to be a way of shame in Lambeth into a response. But they haven't. And it's been out since January, I think. And how's the response been from the people since the book's been released? I had to sit down. When it first came out, I had to sit down and go, is this really happening? Because I just could not believe the power of Facebook because we advertised it. A friend of mine took pictures of the, of the first book and we advertised on Facebook amongst friends. I've had, it's in the libraries in Australia, in Queensland. I 
think it could possibly be going into the libraries here, available on order if people want to order it. Um, I'd like it to be turned into a documentary because it's okay doing this. But if people don't see you, who you are, and then I don't think they quite get the gist of it. You can listen to a radio show or a football match, and it's totally different to the, the football match that. you're watching at the same time on the telly. You know, and I don't honestly think people were really interested in what went on in the 50s and 60s. You know, it's an old era where a dying breed, as the police said to me, there is no case because all the perpetrators are dead. My answer, there is no case because you didn't fucking listen. When I went to you as a child, on numerous occasions, you didn't listen when I went to you in London and said, look, this is what happened. You know, and all right, when I went to you people, I was, a, I was a mess. I understand that. But even messes hurt. If you keep a melange long enough, it'll go fucking mouldy. If an abused person holds it in long enough, it'll go fucking crackers. I did. I wanted to kill. I did go crackers, and through it all, I lost everything. But also, on the other hand, I've got everything. I've got a comfortable home, I've got a cracking missus, and absolutely my love of my life, my soul, my rock, you know, backs me all the way. and. If it took 60 years of misery to get there, I got it. I got what I wanted. Because this is all I ever wanted. A home, a family. Peace, happiness. A fucking dog. <laughs> a cat. No, it's, it's all... I've had the days, I've had Rolls Royces. All right, they were stolen. <laughs> I've had a Bentley. That was legal. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been around the world. I've lived the high life, the good life, the bad life. I'm still here. What was your life like in the, your like, teenage, early 20s, Michael? I, was a fi- I became a fisherman. Yeah. Deep water fisherman. For, for your 20s, 30s? Yeah, and I went in the Foreign Legion for a spell. Got married a couple of times. Used to get tax rebates in them days. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I just went on, I was wild. I, I was not a nice person. But again. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have wanted to know me and you certainly wouldn't have spoken to me 13 years ago. You wouldn't be saying it now. So when did you, did you go to counselling? Did you go to? No. Nothing? No. What happened when you were in the loony bin? I met Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> I met George. Did you get any like therapy or anything to No, shit loads of drugs. Was I just fill you with drugs, numb your yeah. pain, numb your mind, quiet you down? Yeah, but then there was more drugs coming through the windows. Yeah. Illegal drugs coming through the windows and then staff were ever dishing you out, but you would you were just kept down. Yeah. Counselling, no fucking counselling, nothing. You just left to your own devices. Uh-huh. So, um, so going forward for yourself, with the book being released now, what's the plans for you for the future? Uh, probably a fitting with the Undertaker in the not <laughs> long, too long distant uh-huh. future. But I have no Georgie and I have no plans. Day by day. Yeah, we we take she's ill, she's not well, and we don't want to go on holiday. It doesn't appeal. To up to that, you know, the days of I did crave fame and glory, of course, you do. And 
I could see Keith Richards playing the older me in a film and Iggy Pop, you know, or Johnny Depp playing the younger versions of me, the lunatics. You know, I dreamt of that and I fantasise about it. But at the end of the day, all I want is for people to read the story. You can get it for fuck all on Kindle. You can read it for nothing. You can download it for four quid. I, I don't have any money out of it. I don't get nothing. I don't want nothing out of it. But go, well, did this happen? Now, whether they believe it or whether they don't, they'll certainly take fucking notice. They'll stick in their minds, you know. And if they go, well, maybe this did happen. He's come out of it. And maybe from the way I describe how my behaviour went, if they see a youngster going exactly the same way or going wild for no reason, you can bet your life there is some kind of abuse going on somewhere. Yeah. For people watching this, Michael, who's been abused or maybe too scared to speak out, what advice would you give them? Talk about it. Talk to someone. Because if you don't, it'll kill you. Eat your way inside and... Inside, it'll kill you outside. It'll take over your life mm -hmm. right to the extent where you will take your, your own life. Yeah. So moving forward with the book, obviously it's out now. What do you want to happen now since with the release? With the release? Yeah, the documentary, film. It's to bring the book into a film, maybe documentary. I think it's something that, if a documentary is made, mm -hmm. I think this has to be, it should be shown to parents' groups, to schools, you know, not as a, um, a titillating tale of sex and drugs and fucking rock and roll, but as a serious serious look at how the abuse that was going on in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, when there were no police to police it, because the police were part of it, to how it's going on today, when all the safeguards are in place. And also, for people, I can spot an abused child a mile off. I've only got to look at them and I will know there is something wrong. I wouldn't be able to say that kid's being sexually abused or physically abused. But just by talking to a child, I will know because I've been there. What's the telltale signs? Sullenness, anger, depression, tiredness. A dullness in the eyes. The life's gone. You can see it. There's no spark there. You know, and you withdraw. And if you withdraw from something you're fighting against, believe you me, it's like football. If it's defence, pull back the attack or go right on them and invariably score. You know, and you can put that to abuse lives. And it's, people have got to understand that for everyone like this Nick, who has come out with all his lurid stories of boys, seeing boys being killed, blah, 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 right? For every one of them, there's nine who have been abused. And the damage, I think, that this Nick, well, maybe not so much Nick, you know, because who knows what went on? Mm -hmm. You know, you, would you really make that kind of shit up? 
I don't know. Yeah. So and, as, as much as you've seen other kids getting raped, did you ever see any like serious violence? Like, no. Really big beatings and no. close to death? No. Nothing like that? Nope. And I never saw another child being penetrated. Oh, did you not? Nope. I saw children, boys, on men's knees and being cuddled. But these people aren't going to do things in front of people, for goodness sake. They'll do it in front of their own. But they're not going to do it, get three or four kids together and do it. Yeah. I think it's a massive talking point in the UK now that not a lot of people want to talk about. A lot of people are scared of this subject, but it goes on everywhere. Do you think it's a mass, mass cover-up from the higher powers and people who well, have got a lot of power? I'm, I'm astonished, actually. I mean, I don't speak for any other survivors group. I don't know anything about them. I don't know what went on at Beach Home, you know, or Wood Vale or the quarries. I haven't got a clue because I wasn't there. I can only say what went on in my life, my time in the kids' homes and in every single home that they put me in, bar one, the convent, I was sexually abused and bought and sold. And it was almost, they expect you, they know you're coming, of course they know you're coming. And they know why you're there, why you've been moved, you know. And it, it was almost a way of feeding the tiger. You know, if you want to feed tigers, Right? Feed them. And they'll follow you. It's as simple as that. And they were doing the same with kids. You know, only it wasn't the days, oh, come and look at the puffies or my bunny rabbits. We didn't have a choice. We had no one to turn to. There's no parents coming to visit me in a kid's home or asking why I've got a black eye. Yeah, so they could cover it up well. Who, who was going to care about us? Yeah. Nobody. Nobody would come and see us. Mm -hmm. We had no visas, no letters. So we were fodder to the cannon. Do you think it's as bad still to this day, Michael? <sighs> it's kind of different now, isn't it? It's different. It's... It's gone so politically correct that you can't say anything about it anymore because you get the nutters launch in and give you bundles of ag. You know, if, if you look at the history of the paedophile exchange, right, pie. Have a look who's involved, for fuck's sake. You've got MPs involved there. All right, I'm not saying they were abusing children. But when you've got MPs involved in the paedophile information exchange, what chance has anybody got? Yeah. We haven't got any chance. Michael for your story today and coming on and telling it brother I really appreciate it your book Meet Rack Boys is out you can get it in Kindle Amazon, Amazon. also yeah. um, so for people to check it out and listen mate I know what you're doing I, have, I think it's phenomenal to speak out I really do and I, and I know you don't think it it's but you're an inspiration it's yeah yeah do you know what you are mate and for people who's going through that it's kind of pain it can help life and can help people coming forward so for me that is an inspiration it's good to see you happy it's good to see you've got your cats your dogs you're at the seafront, and it's good that you're enjoying your years. No, um, twilight year is going to be good. <laughs> but would you like to finish up with anything, Miko? No, thank thank you for coming up. It was totally unexpected. I was just giving a message yesterday. You know, I I just hope that 
people who watch this or listen to it because oh, I don't know how these things work, right, understand that you can come through this. Hmm. Yeah, you can get to it, It's taken me 64 years. But was it worth it? Yeah. Yeah. Telling the story. Monastery wise. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, you know, it's cost me getting it out there. But I don't regret one minute telling my story. Mm -hmm. I really wish that I'd done it earlier. I really wish that at the time, you know, 10 years ago, 11, that I'd gone, oh, fuck it, I'm going to make some money out of this because I, I think I've, I would have probably made a few quid. But I don't think it would have been as straight as it is. I would have lied. You know, hey, yeah, hindsight's a great thing. And No, I would have lied. I yeah. know that. I'd have made all sorts of accusations mm -hmm. against people. I wouldn't have named them, but I would have dropped bloody big hints as to who they were. And But um, I can't see any point in that. You know, I'm not going to come out and say, Cliff Richard told me, because I can't stand bloody Cliff Richard, and he'd be the last person I'd allow to Tom me. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> All right, my, my sense of humor, I can laugh about it now. Mm -hmm. I can look back and I can laugh about it. And I wasn't able to do that a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And I can talk about it. There is no shame. There's sadness, for sure. To, I don't know. To the people, if they're alive, that I hurt along the way, I can only say, look, I'm sorry. But the guy, the Taragu, who hurt you, robbed you, stole from you, isn't the Taragu you see today. You know, I'm a sick old man. I don't want to be fighting anymore. I want to be relaxed and getting it out, and doing something like this. Now, I don't know, you might just fucking bin this. No chance. And go, what a load of old bollocks, you know, that he spoke, and he doesn't come across well at all. I don't care. Yeah. You bin it, you bin it, I couldn't give a toss. Yeah, I'm not be happening, mate. You know what I mean? I'm not saying you are, but this is the attitude I yeah, have Yeah, the, the fuck it attitude. Because it's out. Nobody, the... The response, the support has been phenomenal. And was it worth telling my story? Yeah, I think mm -hmm. it was. Excellent. The response is only going to get bigger, I think, Michael. And the fact that 64 years, it says it took a hurt and pain and misery. The fact that you've still got a smile on your face, brother, and the fact that you're still happy, now that you're happy, says a lot about you, brother. And listen... I wish you all the best. And Thank you for coming up. Yeah, not a problem. God bless. Thank you.